TLO, what's poppin'? We are on Twitch, we are not live, but you can leave a like, comment, subscribe, turn on your post notification bells. Let's continue to grow the family from Chicago to the UK, man. You see it right behind me, this is the warning screen. Take heed of it, man. Don't forget we are on Patreon. I mean, we do got a Patreon where we post five days a week things that we cannot post to YouTube. We also got merch and twitch.com username at the bottom of the screen is where you can catch the live streams. Uh, this is Talk TV. I always like to react to Talk TV, man. They got some touch they got some points, some controversial points that a person like me would love to discuss sometimes. There's 11-year-olds carrying zombie knives. How London became UK's knife crime capital. Seems like at least seven times a week we can cover this topic. <laughs> Uh, let's get into it though. Copyright, copyright disclaimer, disclaimer under section 107 of the Copyright Act 1976. Allowance is made for fair use for purposes such as criticism, comment, news reporting, teaching, scholarship, and research. Fair use is a use permitted by copyright statute that might otherwise be infringing. Nonprofit, educational, or personal use tips the balance in favor of fair use. No copyright infringement intended. All rights belong to their respective owners. Talk to me. See what kind of cap or non cap London or is on a knife edge, with the capital recording a new knife crime incident every 30 minutes. So, what ages are we talking about that this starts from? Talking about 11, 12, as younger. Carrying a zombie knife? Yes, what? 100%. Despite volunteers' best efforts to stop the scourge of stabbings, menacing blades, swords, and machetes continue to flood the streets. What purpose, yeah? Can these retailers have what been sending that? these kind of weapons out to tower blocks in Hackney? There's weapons here with compasses on the bottom of them. Camping. Who's camping in Hackney? So what can be done to turn the tide of grief and loss? Are the police taking the right course of action? And should the mayor of London be doing even more? This is not a black thing. This is a societal thing. This. Oh yeah, definitely. Nah, I, I could say in the UK it feels like a societal thing. In America, you can you can you can kind of pinpoint it on a certain group of people and kind of get away with it, knowing that that's not really a whole thing if you look at the whole of the, you know what I'm saying, whole of the, in the United States. But in the UK, it never seemed like a colored, it, from the outside looking in, it doesn't seem like a colored thing at all. Everybody be having it out there. This is an epidemic. This is the real story of knife crime in London. Okay. Despite... Knife crime is a problem that has blighted London for decades. Despite previously being dismissed as a race or gang issue, a series of alarming and unprovoked attacks have left many in the capital fearing for their safety. And the victims are often tragically young. In 2023 <coughs> alone, 18 teenagers lost their lives to a blade in London. A teenage boy has been arrested after a 15-year-old girl was stabbed to death on her way to school. Oh uh, man, I remember that one. Ali Anandam fatally right, stabbed protecting a friend from a foot-long knife on a bus in Croydon. 16-year-old Harry Pittman went out to watch the fireworks and celebrate the new year, but never made it home. And the aspiring young boxer, 20-year-old Bradley Hutchins, None of these killings were affiliated with any gangs. Um, there's a couple of things just in my day-to-day, my day-to-day -day, day -day everyday life when I was in Chicago that I would uh, avoid. I avoided two here in Florida, but like sp sparingly avoid in Chicago. Whenever I took tr public transportation, I minded my business. 100%. Because it might not be aimed at you to start with, but it can quickly aim towards you. For inter like and and, and I I might sound oh man you supposed to be a man you supposed to be heroic no I'm supposed to protect my life you know what I'm saying I'm supposed to worry about me and mine you know what I'm saying that's one thing that I'm not minding my business on a train um <clears throat> second thing I'm not going to no parties not going to no New Year's Eve events anything special occasion -y, not doing it. So New Year's, Halloween, any, not going to do it. I'm not participating. Because people don't know how to act. Uh, and the third thing, 
I was gonna say something about boxing because I used to box, but like in Chicago, it's different from the culture in Chicago is way different than it is in the UK. I don't know how what happened to lead to him losing his life. I don't know the backstory, but what I'm gonna say, I'm a guess, right? I don't know if this is what happened. Somebody tell me in the comments. But dude is a boxer. He's probably a well-known boxer in his plot. You know what I'm saying? So anybody coming to fight him, you're not probably going to win. And they know that. You know what I'm saying? But see, in Chicago, ain't no boxing. Nobody fights. So it doesn't, that doesn't even apply in America. I mean, in Chicago. Shockingly, these attacks are no longer confined to the cover of darkness. They're happening in broad daylight. I was just trying to deliver food. Areas in front of horrified onlookers. <gasps> Figures from the Met Police show incidents involving a knife in the last year have risen to nearly the same level of the pre-pandemic high. One man who's trying to reverse the trend is Farron Paul. Operating his own amnesty, Farron is regularly contacted by concerned members of the public eager to get weapons off the street. We received a tip off that a knife collection was taking place, but nothing could prepare us we for the scale Farron of what we'd see next. And even Farron is shocked at the sheer volume <coughs> of this latest collection. Dang. This is quite a substantial one. I think this could be the biggest that we've done. Man's got a sharpener. Let's just say dude's well equipped in it. Alarmingly, all of these blades, knives, and weapons came from one single person. I've run this weapon down this week. Uh, this came from one human being? About five years now. And a lot of my communication and interaction comes through social media. I believe that when somebody comes into the position where they've got weapons to get rid of, um, I'm the first person that comes to mind. On this particular occasion, um, when your team followed me out, it was um, from one of my long-term followers. I picked up a lot of weapons. But well, these ones are kind of surprising me still. They look dangerous to you. Just a bit of wood in it. This is very dangerous. That's highly dangerous, man. Did you take off that? that was a, a younger female family member of his. Um, their boyfriend is keeping all the stuff in the house. Um, and he spoke to them to get rid of him. And they came to an arrangement to hand it over to me. Why do you think people pick up knives like this then? because they're easily accessible. For one, you can go online. Um, for instance, I went and picked up a, um, a weapon of a young person, their mum contacted me, and the person's 40 in her hand. It's normal for a parent to give the younger child a bank card, whether they open an account for them or they're letting them use their card. And this guy's explained to me that he's gone online, he's managed to buy a weapon and then get it transferred to an Amazon lockbox, which he'd only need a code, no ID needed, no questions asked, and it's not, gonna get delivered on mommy's doorstep. Imagine this got delivered to someone's house through the mail. And yeah, man, I just started noticing that because I ain't really was buying nothing off Amazon, but I just started peeping that you could put it in a lockbox near you instead of delivering it straight to your crib. And that that's, that's, that's peak for criminal activity. That's different, that's different. They just said it, I'm just reiterating it, but that is different. That never Especially for, not so much in America, but for a place like the UK where Bladed articles are illegal. Like, yeah, I could see that being an issue. But I, I don't think Amazon would regulate that. I don't... Letterbox, did you? That's, that, that's going to be someone clearly knocking the door saying, hi, special delivery for you or something like that. What, what purpose, yeah, can these retailers have to be sending these kind of weapons out to tower blocks in Hackney? Do you know what I mean? There's weapons here with compasses on the bottom of them. Camping. Who's camping in Hackney? What's the youngest person that you've ever collected a knife from? 11, 11 years old, like in terms of 11 years old. Like we could take away all the designer knives now and we still got to face the prospect of people using kitchen knives. Kitchen knives, yeah. We showed the footage of Farron's Hall to anti-knife activist Donna Murray Turner. She's the Safer Neighbourhood Chair for Croydon. I want to say shocked, but I'm not Croydon. shocked. Disappointed, almost. Why? You want to ask questions? Yeah, I'm far from shocked. The shock value for violence for me is out, really out the door. Uh, but I am like... I am just... Just in awe at the, the style of some of these weapons. Like, they're not being used. 
The most commonly used weapon in the UK is what a kitchen knife, right? How unsafe must one human feel to have that much armory around them accessible to them? I would like to speak to that individual just to hear them talk about why they think that is so necessary. Zombie knives and machetes seem to be getting longer and more menacing, popularized as the weapon of choice for gangs. Max used to be part of a gang and has asked us to protect his identity. He turned his back on a life of crime and now tries to help other young people escape through the charity Project Lifeline. This generation is way worse than my generation. They're not listening. They start fights over Instagram. Social media plays a big, big part of it. Fame, money, drugs, girls. It's a clout thing. This new generation is all for clout. But they think in their head that that's the best thing in the world, which is not. They'll come to People realize People are unalive for clout. Mm -hmm. And what sort of weapons are youths carrying about now? Zombie knives. That's like the most common thing now. Knives that look like swords. Uh, it's really bad. This generation's worst. For me, I'm saying I'm 30 now. For my generation, all the way through to this generation, it's a lot going on. Mental health plays a big part in all of these kids' life or what's going on with their life. Oh, yeah, man. Mental health is a... We do, a lot of the times we hear about this stuff and we don't even really bring mental health to the front of the solution. This generation of children, man, they really going through it. Anxiety levels through the roof. You know what I'm saying? Because they really ain't had no childhoods. They don't know how to cope. Their parents was doing other stuff. So, you know what I'm saying? People need to start looking in into these youths. What do kids say to you when you ask them why they're carrying? Normally they say, yeah, there's a problem. They're beefing other areas. Me, I can't personally go to a kid and say, OK, drop the knife. Don't carry a knife today. Because something happens to that person, I'm going to feel guilty, that's one. And two, would you tell these soldiers to drop their guns when they're going to war? No one can realistically do that to nobody. Because they're not thinking. They're kids at the end of the day. We've got to remember we're dealing with kids that will just take a life like this. So what ages are we talking about that they start from? I'm talking about 11, 12. As younger. Carrying a zombie knife? Yes. What? Well, the youngest active member I've ever seen in Chicago was about 19. I'm talking active though. Like not just, oh yeah, 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 we, we, we. no, active. What's that? If I'm a young person who comes from an area where the majority of the people that I'm going to bump into carry knives, I'm going to be more persuaded to carry a knife for protection, not knowing that the consequences and the probability of that knife being used against me is tremendously high. A lot of young people carrying knives, seeing knives, being around us is due to peer pressure, especially from the ages of, say, you know, 12, 13, going to school, it was a form of protection. Fear can be a huge motivating factor in carrying a knife. It's almost become culturally accepted and culturally expected to carry a knife. When children this young are carrying weapons, it's perhaps unsurprising, but still... That's how it is with firearms too in America. Devastating. That peers their Chicago same age movies. end up dying. Following the tragic deaths of five teenagers in 2021, Croydon was labelled the knife crime capital. Of London's worst affected boroughs, Croydon saw a 25% increase in incidents from 2022 to 2023. Such drastic figures have necessitated a wide-ranging response. So now emergency community meetings are held on a regular basis, bringing together residents, the police, local activists, and campaigners. We got a call at 835 to say that a 14-year-old was stabbed by West Croydon bus station. Uh, thankfully, it wasn't life-threatening. Of course, it'll be life-changing. By 4.30 in the afternoon, we were told that another two people were stabbed, but we've been corrected that it was only one that was stabbed and the other hit over the head by a hammer. This is real. Dang. This is tangible. We are never further than somebody who has experienced it and it keeps on going. The fight against knife crime is far from over in Croydon, so now the police are trialling controversial new technology in a bid to keep criminals off the streets. So on Tuesday, we had a live facial recognition operation in Croydon Town Centre. So on that day, we managed to arrest nine people who have been wanted, some for some time. What do you mean, a facial recognition? Oh. However, there are concerns Cameras? in the community that the use of facial recognition will lead to racial inequality, something previously echoed by civil rights groups. 
It wouldn't be the first time that the police have been accused of unfairly targeting <coughs> certain sections of society. The use of Section. stop and search has led to numerous complaints from black communities about police discrimination. The Met's own statistics. Yeah, I always thought stop and search was a crazy situation. I mean, sure, it might help, but like... At the end of the day, you could, you could, however you feel as a person about somebody, that it really plays on that. Like, oh man, I feel sketchy. My beliefs and my, my personal, my personal views come into this stop and search thing. For sure. As an officer, I would They assume. show that of all the people who were stopped and searched within the last year, 38.8% were black. That's despite London's black community making up only 13.5% of the capital's population. Jeez. And a lot of people are not going to understand that. Oh, yeah, but well, 39.8% was black. Was stopped and searched within the last year. London's black population is only 13%. 38%. You stopped more than half, almost, almost half of them. More than a third. 8% were black. That's despite London's black community making up only 13.5% of the capital's population, according to the latest census. Despite strong criticism for its disproportionate use, some former police officers worked, say stop and search still has an important role to play. Well, I think knife crime's a problem across the country, so it's um, it clearly... Well, stop and search is a crazy thing, because you could just go to a, to a hood and just stop and search everybody. And, but here's the thing, though. You're going to stop and search everybody. You're going to find a blade on a lot of people. But a lot of people carrying it just to protect themselves. And I know the laws are the laws, but the criminals are criminals. They are going to go against the law. So who's going to protect me? <laughs> Figures arrest. Or the law-abiding citizen. In a split second of something happening. Yeah, in hindsight... Or, or I call the police later, but hey, you know what I'm saying? Just, you know, always be worried about what you're doing, man. Always keep your head on a swivel. That's all I got to say. Escalating. Violence is getting worse. Knives are being used more often in violent crimes. So I think it's a huge issue for policing to tackle. I think what works is actually the unpopular aspect of policing, which is stop and search. It's proactive policing. It's officers getting out and, and identifying the people who would like to be carrying knives in society and committing serious crimes, serious assaults. I think that works, albeit it's very unpopular. Policing isn't a popularity contest. It's about protecting the public and protecting society. Stop and search should be done as an intelligence-led, uh, proactive task or tactic. So it's a tactic that police officers use to identify and remove people with knives from society. But I think one of the main problems with stop and search, it's always based or judged on the number of arrests that come from stop and search. That isn't its sole purpose. It's meant as a deterrent factor, as a deterrent tactic. It's clear that knife crime is no longer solely a police issue, but something that has to be tackled on multiple levels. In South London, one charity is doing just that and finding a creative use for thousands of confiscated knives. Steel Warriors takes the weapons and melts down the metal to make public gyms that have been installed in multiple parks across the capital. That's really the core message here uh, at Steel Warriors. It's about turning a negative That's cool. into a positive. And so everything that we focus on here is actually about transformation. Uh, what we do once the gyms have been installed, so there's a manufacturing process that converts the, 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 the actual knives into the, the bars that you see behind us here. Once that process is finished and the gyms are installed, we then teach calisthenics and body weight training so that the place is actually not left redundant. The knives actually come from uh, an amnesty process. So the knives are kept in storage. They come from the police, the amnesty bins, the proceeds of stop and search. The principle is to ensure that fitness is not a privilege. Um, we encourage fitness for basically everybody. So our gyms are centred in gang neutral zones in publicly accessible places and spaces. The people using these gyms have fostered a close community who want to improve their fitness and their local area, in part because knife crime is never far away. Do any of you know people that have carried knives previously? Show of hands. Nowadays, we have a problem with the youth not really knowing what to do. We're all bored. And when we're bored, one thing that we can turn to is our emotions. A lot of people nowadays, like, they're just angry. Like, they just want to like, get into problems. But 
when you have something like this outdoor gym here you can actually change you can convert that negative energy into something positive it's a much more productive thing to do than to go outside and look for problems this is one of the best things someone can do for themselves just like these men london teenager ben kinsella had concerns about the danger of knives too he wrote to the highest levels of power urging action to be taken to protect young people then he was tragically stabbed to death in an unprovoked attack Burn. back in 2008. Patrick Green runs a charitable trust That's set insane. up in his name it's, to his warn the youth about crazy. the risks of carrying a knife. This is the Ben Casella exhibition. It's a series of interconnecting rooms which tell the story of Ben and other people who've been directly affected by knife crime. And it tells it in a very immersive way. And we use a lot of interaction and different teaching styles in, in each of the rooms. How bad would you rate knife crime in the capital? As bad as I've ever known it in, in, in many ways. Um, we've, we've seen a really big increase in the last 12 months in terms of knife crime offences. We see it from, from the young people who come to visit the, this exhibition on a, on a a daily basis. Seven out of ten of those young people are concerned about knife crime. Many of them don't feel safe. For those young people who don't feel safe, they are far more likely to think that a knife will protect them and therefore far more likely to think that they may carry a knife in the, in the future. You've got a really inspiration. I hear him. I hear him. And the, 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 the stats that he just laid out, let me go back. Let me make sure. That's what I... We've, we've seen a really big increase in the last 12 months in terms of knife crime offences. We see it from, from the young people who come to visit the, right. this exhibition right. on a daily basis. Seven out of ten of those young people are concerned about knife crime. Many of them don't feel safe. For those young people who Which don't leads feel safe, to... they are far more likely to think that a knife will protect them. Right. And therefore far more likely to think to that think. they may carry a knife in the, in the future. You've got a... That makes sense, though. Because that's what it is here, too. It's not. It's not like. It's not like. It's not like I'm. I'm trying to be part of the problem. I'm just trying to protect myself. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Because, like I said, these criminals gonna criminal. Period. They going They're gonna criminal. They're gonna do. They're, they're gonna be on the opposite side of the law. Really inspirational centre here. What is it that young people tell you once they've gone through, once they've had the talks from various people? It's clear when they leave here, their attitudes and behaviours change. They understand something that they probably haven't connected before, which is that abstract idea that some of them will have about you carrying a knife to protect yourself. They suddenly realise in carrying a knife, they are carrying the pain, misery and tragedy that knife crime brings. One in I will four young people who come here think a knife will protect them. That's a crazy statistic and shows them that education is really needed. We've also seen... I will say, though, carrying that knife or that firearm does make you feel a certain... You walk different, you move different, though, and you're more success, susceptible to, like, negativity. I'm not even going to lie. Because <laughs> you feel like, yeah, hey, nobody better not say nothing to me. Because I got it on me. So, like... So, looking back, like, in hindsight, like... I, like I said, I couldn't kill nobody to not, but I will say, think about it. You know what I'm saying? If you're in a predicament, hey, run, run. Nobody does and you run. You ain't got to be tough. Just be alive. <laughs> Seeing, you know, a propensity for, for knife carrying to get younger. Um, and that's why it's really important to talk to young people, particularly around the last year of their education in primary school and the first year of their education in secondary school. That massive change that, that, that they make in terms of their environment and their friendship groups. Getting in early, helping young people to understand um, some of the challenges they will face and how they can positively um, address those challenges, really, really important. Because otherwise what we, what we tend to see is all the other drivers around knife crime helping young people make more negative decisions and we see increased knife crime. So one of the things we do over at Voice for Youth Against Violence is provide opportunities through sports, whether that's boxing, whether it's football, where they're able to come be part of something greater, something bigger than themselves, learn to communicate, learn to relate to other people. A lot of young people um, are, are carrying trauma. Through these programmes, we look at developing a positive mindset, look at positive interactions and making them feel positive about themselves. And our programmes are, are aimed at tackling at early age, getting in with some of the worst prolific offenders and providing alternatives for these helpless young victims. Multiple charities that we spoke to said that the actions that they can take will only go so far and what's really needed is more funding, fast. So many conversations, the people in them are so disassociated from the realities of what's going on in working class lives in London 
but yet you're making decisions over public health approaches and who gets funding and who doesn't. What is this going to look like for Britain? Because it's not just happening in London. This is happening in Norwich and in other places. We've seen it on the news. This is not a black thing. This is a societal thing. This is an epidemic. Because this generation's gone bad. And if it gets worse than this, it's you lot won't be able to manage nothing. You gotta say, man, like, it's not all this generation's fault. It's the previous generation before. We set it up for them to be even more crazier than us. You know what I'm saying? It just gets progressively worse through the generations, and somewhere it's gonna have to stop. So it can be turned around, you know what I'm saying? I'm not gonna say we wasn't turned up in, in my generation, because I'm in his generation. I'm not going to say it's, we wasn't turned, because we was. It's just like, now they just even more. We reached out to both the mayor's office and the Metropolitan Police. Both declined to give us an interview. Instead, Sadiq Khan's communications team provided us with a press release drawing comparisons to the rise in violent crime and the cost of living crisis. Does the mayor of London get it? Absolutely not. I definitely see him attend a lot of children's funerals, so I couldn't really speak to does he get it personally. I know he's a parent. I'm sure as a human being he understands. But I think this is now becoming something that has political legs. Would you be willing to take Sadiq Khan out on the street so he can see it firsthand? A hundred, I would love to take him into Croydon. He comes to Croydon and meet the real youths that really need help, and then you'll see what is going on. Because I don't think he knows what's going on. They say they do, but they don't. For too long, with, with nah, they, they always say they do. They they never really do. It's just a it's just a way to thrust their political campaign, and you know what I'm saying to get more votes, and you know we've seen a lot of uh, bickering and um, the knife crime being used as a political football. We have see? suffered in terms of the approach of tackling the issue. Politicians this is a national issue. Let's get behind this and let's tackle this together. There's a huge issue within policing. I think policing across the country, and specifically in London, is broken. Um, I think it's going to take five, maybe ten years to get it anywhere near what it should be. And in Chicago, it's going to take 20. <laughs> what it used to be. So I think right away across society, whoever the next government is, whenever the next general election is, has got a massive issue in dealing with crime, punishment, law enforcement. So far, at least 20 people have been knifed to death in London in the first four months of this year. As we've heard, there's a long way ahead people? to getting the situation under control. 20 people in London? What Didn't it say like 14 was the last year? Oh, man. Control. But despite the gloomy statistics and the frequency of attacks, experts say they still have hope that the number of deaths... London got the crazy skyline. This is what it see. I ain't even gonna hold you this mug. Look good. I took and injuries people. from stabbings will be slashed instead of innocent people in the capital. I'm very hopeful. Um, we, in 2021, we had six children from this borough that was murdered. Five were murdered in the borough. One of our children went into Lambeth and got murdered. Apart from Eliane, who wasn't involved in any gang activity, we're now on 26 months with no teenage murder associated with gangs in the borough. So there is uh, that potential There's with definitely the hope. work that you guys do. Definitely hope. I am hopeful. I have a godson, he's six, and I look at him and my own children are now teenagers and it's for him and his generation that I continue. And it is hard and sometimes you need a bit of support, but hope comes from waking up every day and hitting the ground and saying, today I hope to make a change for just one person. And that's all I'm doing my best to put my daughter in private school. I don't care, not, no, not all girls school, but private school, boys and girls, because putting your kids in private school with one gender is crazy. Like, all, like an all girls school, all boys school, like, I've always thought that was like something like, I don't know, to each their own, but I wouldn't do it. Because the outcome of that is insane. If you up, if you know, like, like my generation would know the outcome of you putting your daughter in an all girl school, what they're going to do behind your back. And once they hit college, oh, yeah, it's up. Mm -hmm. We can never do. For young people believing that I'm, it's too late for me to put down a knife, it's too late for me to leave again, it's too late for me to make a, a, a positive choice. I'm telling you from somebody who's been there, who's done it, it is never too late. The fact that you're breathing and you're watching this is an opportunity 
there is an opportunity for you to change. You can become something. You can become more. 100%. You don't have to be a victim. 100%. You don't have to carry a knife to feel protected. When you're actually involved in carrying a knife, involved in stabbing, being a victim of being stabbed, it does pretty much feel impossible. I'm here to tell you that it's not impossible. In fact, it's very possible. It, it, it won't be easy. It will come with a lot of sacrifice but it will be one of the best choices you can ever and have ever made. As Croydon lifts itself out of that title, there'll be other places that then fall into the worst for knife crime in the capital, in the country. Knowing what you guys have done- They shouldn't even release them type of statistics, man, because you know, like in the hood, they be going for that. Like, oh dang, we was number two this year, man. We what can we do? Like, they be, they be- I'm here telling. with the various partnerships that you've got, what is your advice to those towns, those cities that then find themselves in that terrible position? Very good question. I'd say three things. Number one, as a community, you need to pull together. The community is not only one that's reflective of colour, but the community is shared views of a locality. I'd recommend to other boroughs, try and have a weekly meeting where your local residents, the police, the local authority, where you can be together collegiately with a shared view, shared value, and a shared commitment to reducing serious youth crime in a, in a community. I remember three, four years ago, I never thought I'd be sitting in meetings with the <laughs> Metropolitan Police on a weekly basis, but we have, we've been consistent for weekly for years, and uh, we continue to do so. We have the Mayor of Croydon, who's regularly in our meetings. We have head teachers regularly in the meetings. Uh, we have politicians in the meetings every week. That's good. But more importantly, we have the community in the meetings, and it can happen. The community can stand together to bring about change. That's good. That's good, man. If everybody's all united as a community, man, it's a slow grind, but if, I mean, I guess eventually. Like they said, though, it's going to take 10 to 15. I'm gone.